Uh, you know, every six seconds is your second album, technically. Right. Uh, but there was a, a fairly uh, large gap in time between the first, which is kind of a demo almost, Absolutely. and the second one. What was the reason by, behind taking that time between? Um, well, <clears throat> we had been playing in Memphis, and we wanted to put out something for our fans. You know, we, we had waited on the recording industry to come around to us and had gotten pretty disillusioned. So we, uh, we, we, we just picked up the, the ball ourselves and jumped in the studio and like you said, recorded basically some demos. Um, they were just planned to be demos, and our fans were like, please just give us a tape or a CD or something, man, you know? So we had built up a, a massive fan base there in Memphis and uh, the surrounding areas, and we just threw it on a CD and uh, got with this uh, with this gentleman in, in Memphis and, and put out a little independent record and uh, immediately sold just a, a, a lot of copies, you know, and, and started to move a lot of plastic. and. We were really pleased with it, you know, and excited about it and everything. But we we just did it for the fans, you know, because the, the fans are the reason you do this. What did you gain as a band in that time? I mean, sort of having four, three or four, maybe five years before, sort of jumping into this. I think we band gained. Wagon. I think we gained. Uh, what did we gain from that five years? I think we gained maturity. Uh, our songwriting definitely uh, gelled. Um, as performers, we. Uh, uh, you know, had an immediate creativity together and an a, uh, aura together that, that was completely tangible. So it, I think it gave our sound time to mature and, and to, for all of us to get on the right page and uh, blend the melting pot of musical styles that we blend, basically. Now, did you take that time to sort of develop a, a very specific type of, uh, you know, stage presence, or is that an immediate thing for you guys? That's just something that we that we already had basically because we've all been in, in bands together before and and seen each other play before, and we, we we're pretty much on the same page as far as that goes. That's just something that the live show is is something that just really comes naturally, mm -hmm. you know, the, the performance wise. We were we were more into the. Uh, to the music and the crafting of styles and uh, the, 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 the blending of styles and the freedom of the music. You know, just listening to the album, there's you know, obviously a lot of different musical influences going on there. Uh, how do you guys negotiate that? I mean, you know, your interest in you know, sort of a heavy sound or interest in hip hop <laughs> or an interest in soul or, I mean, how do you negotiate that into one song? Right, we, we don't really negotiate it at all. It's just something that happens kind of naturally. Um, you know, Chris has a very percussive way of, of playing guitar. Wayne has the fairy dust over the top, and Paul drops a fat beat in behind all that. And, and you know, Dave has his, has his own creative way of laying down the bass tracks. And I try to I try to make it vocally uh, as interesting as possible. You know. Now, reading over a lot of the material and just seeing uh, a couple of the interviews you guys have done, there's this word that just keeps coming up that seems to be. Uh, you know, sort of symbolic of your music, and that's the word bounce. I was wondering if you guys could yeah. just sort of explain that. Bounce is a Dirty South method of, um, it's a Dirty South style of, of rapping. It's been around for years, and it seems like now everybody's kind of figured, put two and two together, you know. We've been doing it for years, and, you know, 36 Mafia, Cash Money Click, Project Pat, you know, all them guys in Memphis, uh, with the exception of, um, with the exception of uh, Cash Money Millionaire, they're from New Orleans, but uh, you know it's just something we've been doing for a long time. You know, it's it's more of a, it's not a West Coast style of rap or hip hop, and it's becoming and has you know become over the last three or four years that's the style in New York too, but I think it all originated from the South. It's yeah. just a definite, you know, if it don't if it don't bounce, you know, even if it's a even if it's a ballad with us or or you know if it's a a, a totally singing, melodic, emotional song. It still has to have that bounce to it, that groove that makes your head yeah, move, and makes your body is move. Bounce this when you you know you hear something and you're like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, that's bounce. If it don't, know. if it don't do, if that, don't do that, then it ain't a saliva song. Does it change from each song? I mean, what you uh, guys absolutely. equate as bounce? Absolutely. With, with a drummer like Paul, you know, he's very innovative and comes up with, you know, all, all different kinds of uh, tricks. He's got a he's got a big bag of tricks, you know, so. He, he always comes up with something really tight and really fat. Being, and us being, you know, all on the same page musically, it, it all just blends together. Now you say you're all on the same page musically, but I, I know that everybody kind of brings 
their own sort of their own sort of musical interests to the table. Absolutely, yeah. it's like it's like five different colors of the rainbow. You know, yeah. Chris brings his percussive style. Dave has a darker style of writing. We, all five of us write in this band, so you know, Dave has a darker style, sort of a, a Pink Floyd toolish sort of style, and. Uh, Wayne has the you know the rock and roll style, and uh, Chris has the percussive, dirty South hip hop style, and uh, I, I write a lot of uh, uh, really melodic, dreamy stuff as well, you know, and we, we just put it all together. Yeah, I think that really comes out on uh, listening to that on the last three songs right. on the album, uh, Hollywood Dope, Right and My Goodbyes. It's just really three drastic turns right there, but it's, yeah. it's pretty seamless <laughs> at the same time. Thank you. Thank it, you. It's. Uh, you know, almost sort of embodies the album. I was wondering if there was one song in the album as a whole that, that seems to really sort of embody, you know, every success. I think um, I think After Me is a good example of, of, of the embodiment of every six seconds. Uh, After Me is one that Chris wrote that's his t typical style, the percussive guitar playing uh, intro, you know, to the verses, to the wide open chorus. Um, and I think it's interesting because you would expect or we would expect, you know, to, to maybe throw in rap. We use rap as a spice. We don't consider ourselves a rap rock band, you know. Uh, I think titles are pretty limiting in, in anyway, but uh, we, you, we would have thought it would have called for sort of a, a hip hop style verse, but I just began to sing over it and it all came together really fast. So I think that with that in mind, I think it embodies the album. You know, it's very melodic over the verses and then it has that wide open sing along chorus. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much our formula. Uh, in anything we do, it has to have the bounce and it has to have the hook, because uh, that's what we call the money. You know, that's the money shot. Now, you know, you've obviously been on tour a long time and almost a year right now. Have the songs and the album taken on a new life since you've recorded them and now that they're playing? You know, that they're being played on stage. I mean, do they become Absolutely. slightly different? Absolutely. Um, we cater to the live audience. You know, we uh, we have have probably. Um, Measured our songs along with the crowd uh, to fit uh, to fit the live the live show. We call the live we call our live show our secret weapon. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know when people when people hear an album like every six seconds, you know we had great reviews on it and our fans seem to really dig it. So we want to take that to the next level when they see us visually. You know and and can hear the music and see us visually. We want to take that to the next level so that that can match up and intertwine with how good the album is. Do you guys find new things in the songs when you play them live that you didn't know that the song could go in a certain direction? It's, yeah, sort of. I mean, it's like we find parts that we probably didn't know, you know. We, it, when, when, you, when, you, when you record those songs, they're your little babies, you know, and you take care of them and you nurture them and you watch them grow and then you go on the road and like you said, they sort of take on a, a different life. We may add a part or take away a part depending on the audience. Uh, participation level or or what have you we just sort of feel out the crowd and and uh, give it to them with both barrels now you guys are from Memphis and uh, you know Memphis is just a music rich city I mean, it's one of the, the most musically rich cities in, in the country you know Elvis and the blues and Southern Soul where does your sound reflect that on on some level I think it's um I think we're products of of 80s pop radio I think we're products of heavy metal I think we're products of our surroundings in Memphis, <coughs> we're, we're, we're uh, definitely a product of the blues, we're definitely a product of gospel, we're definitely a product of uh, all those styles that uh, were, were sort of invented, you know, right there around Memphis. I mean, you can, you can go see a, you, you can see a gospel choir standing on the corner singing all the way to the, the, the old uh, African American gentleman on the corner, you know, with a, with a spit can in front of his guitar picking out some of the dopest blues you've ever heard so we grew up as little kids being influenced by that and along with you know radio we didn't have albums when I was a kid I grew up my parents didn't have you know that kind of money or whatever we didn't have a stereo we basically had a, me and my sister had a radio so and I know Chris uh, had the same thing so we pretty much depended on the radio you know and what was popular then so 70s, 80s pop radio, uh, definitely a product of that and a product of the surroundings in Memphis. That's why we've always said that our style is sort of a melting pot. Uh, are you surprised by your fans and in, in, in the types of fans that show up to your shows? Always. And uh, <laughs> like their sort of knowledge of music? I mean, are, do, do you, are you ever impressed with them? Uh, always. Oh, yeah. uh, it's a, a never-ending sure. 
n never ending impression, man. Every every time you pull up and people know, you, just the fact that they know our name is amazing <laughs> to me. You know, the fact that they want our stinking little autograph on their T-shirt is amazing to me. You know, we we grew up. You know, we grew up just like everybody else. We're rock fans. You know, I used to put on Kiss Destroyer and stand in front of the mirror with a broom in my hand and, you know, <laughs> pretend I was Ace Freely. It sounds familiar. Uh, <laughs> you or know, a tennis I, racket. I, I think everybody did that and went through that stage. So to see it come to fruition now, to see the fans and to, to see the attention that we've gotten from our art and from our music is just totally a blessing and totally, you know, <coughs> uh, we're, we're totally fortunate and humbled by the experience. I think. Some bands, you know, have been accused of becoming arrogant or becoming, you know, full of themselves. I think with Saliva, it's quite the contrary because the more popular we get and, and the more fame we gain and the more respect we get from our fans, the humbler we become because we know this is, this is totally a gift. Mm -hmm. Now, Chris, I'd read that uh, somewhere that you were talking about fans and how open they were musically and just how there's just less and less boundaries today. And, and I was wondering if you saw that in your audiences and, and just... Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, Snoop Dogg or Jay-Z or DMX or Ludacris could, could be on the same stage that we're on and they go, they'll go over and then we'll come up, you know, uh, play that night and then we'll go over. So I think the beautiful thing about the fans and the, and the record buyers today is that everything goes you know it's like d all the above you know there ain't no a b or c no more it's just it's all the above they're they're cool they're educated especially with the information age with technology and computers you know good music is good music at the bottom line at the end of the day you know that's why we have people who are 14 to 40 years old at, at our shows you know i mean mothers and fathers are bringing their kids you know, and their kids are totally stoked, and then their moms are totally stoked. I met a girl the other day where her mom stole her CD and wouldn't <laughs> give it back, you know. So it's, it's a wide variety, and we're proud of that. That's what, that's what we wanted to do as, as artists all these years, and we put the saliva together four years ago, and it just, that's, that's what we got, you know. That's, we're happy. We don't even fight or nothing like that. We're just good friends first and business partners second. And mothers and daughters can be fun. <laughs> <laughs> That, you know, seeing parents at your shows might, might be, throw some people, but I know that uh, when you guys were doing, yeah, earlier in your career, doing the sort of Battle of Bands uh, experience that you went through at, right. in Memphis, and I think you went down to Austin for a larger show. Semifinals, case. yeah. But there was some, some type of altercation that broke out uh, at a show. There was riot <coughs> gear, I think. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. Yeah, in, in, um, in Austin, Texas, we were, we were down there playing um, against uh, the bands from, that had won in Atlanta, uh, Nashville, and Dallas had won the Grammy Showcase as well in their town, so they got it down to the semifinals and we went to Austin, Texas. And um, we were just really disillusioned by then because we thought, you know, we, we were shocked that we made it out of political Memphis, you know. We thought the fact that, you know, certain people were playing on stage in Memphis and the political pull they had there in the Memphis music scene, you know, we're going to walk away with it. We just wanted to show up. We had only been together for four, four weeks. We just wanted yeah. to show up and, and test our songs out on a live audience. Right. And we ended up winning the thing, so we went on to Austin. <laughs> this kid from Dallas, um, this kid that won the show in Dallas um, was from Austin. Not only was he from Austin, his uncle was Stevie Ray Vaughan. So we were like, oh, God, we're dead. <laughs> plus he was good. You know? Yeah, plus yeah. he was amazing. Yeah. yeah. And so... Uh, so they, uh, the band from Nashville went on first, Atlanta went second, and this kid went on third, and I was just like, and it was his hometown crowd, I mean, get, get the hell out of here, you right. know. I was like, well, we had a good time, let's just get up there and rock, you know, and uh, we, 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 we grinned and bared it and got up there and just kicked as much ass as we could in 30 minutes, and, uh, and it got violent, man. It got, <laughs> we, there, was, there was a pit, and, uh, you know, bodies were flying everywhere and and next thing we know there was yellow shirts in front of us then there were blue shirts in front of us and then there were cops in front of us and we were like Black. whoa <laughs> they, and they had like helmets and, and yeah, shields i was like oh dude this is this is cool <laughs> this, <laughs> this just turned the corner of cool you know so uh and at the end of the night they they announced us that we won there too i was um, i was completely shocked me and the me and the kid that was Stevie Ray Vaughan's nephew actually held hands and, and when they were announced the winner and I said, dude, I said, man, you're amazing. I said, either one of us walk away with this. I said, you deserve it. 
and you know he said the same to me and we just stood there and held hands and they said that we were the winner and I was like oh my god I get to go to New York City you know <laughs> so we got to go to the Grammys and 19 before we were ever signed or anything we went to the Grammys and in New York City. This was a huge ska era too you know that right. was oh, when yeah. ska could do no wrong. Right. Yeah. You know, here's a little little rock band from Memphis 10, you know. <laughs> no one even pays attention to that part of the country anyway, unless it's got the word Elvis attached to it. Right. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, everybody thinks that's where country music come from, but that's Nashville. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> we're in the city over. Um, you know, so we were, we were surprised. <laughs> So it's happy, you know. It sounds we, like it was a defining moment for you. Absolutely, guys. it was. It was absolutely a defining moment. It was the turning point in our careers where we knew that. I mean, we knew from the time the five of us got in the same room together, we knew that it was that you know things were going to be serious, and this was we really were going to have a shot. But that at that point, it was like it's on. You know, it's on. We were about to be hurled into the vortex, and uh, and and we were ready to we were ready to do it with our pants off and our and our. <laughs> Sock <heart>. song. <laughs> now, you know, listening to, to the album, it, it's not quite a concept album, but there seems to be a real sort of uh, togetherness. There's, right. a, there's a unifying theme. I was wondering if maybe we could end on that question. I think, I think that um, when, you, when we got into the creative process, it sort of took on its own animal, you know? I mean, by the time we got through recording the songs and working with Bob Marlette, who was amazing, uh, it, it took on a life of its own, you know, and we just kind of let it let it be what it was. That's why we named it Every Six Seconds, was because it, it it was a sexual album, it was a rock and roll album, it was a heavy album, it was an angry album. It said everything we wanted to say, you know, about about life and heartbreak and sex and death and God and just everything all in one. You know, it's, it, it was definitely uh, a, a release for us so by the time we got through recording it you know uh, I think it took on a life of its own and uh, we we uh, arranged the songs in a way that we thought was appropriate and and it, it just it became its own monster and uh, we were we were just really really happy with it really uh, pleased at the way it came out and it to me it does kind of seem in retrospect it does kind of seem like a concept record but at the same time, it like I said, it took on a life of its own. And working with people like Leor Cohen and, and and Jeff Finster and Rob Stevenson and Stu Bergen, you can you an album like that is not just going to sit on the sh sit on some shelf and collect dust. They're they're going to push it for what it is and, and uh, definitely make it happen. Alan Def Jam has been amazing for us, you know, because they had done all they wanted to do in hip hop and they wanted to wanted to s conquer the rock world. They wanted right. to see what they could do in rock and roll. So with, it, with an album like Every Six Seconds, they were just ready to give it a full court push. And there's a lot of singles on it as well. I guess Absolutely. you have a new one coming out. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're about to release Superstar. As artists, I mean, we've always been, uh, and as record buyers too in our lives, we've always liked the records and the bands that have a kick-ass record from beginning to end. You know, if it's something I gotta fish through to get to the single in the middle, you know, blah blah blah. Then I don't even I don't even waste my time. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think kids are like that to do, uh, to do mainly today. You know, um, and I think that's the way it's every six seconds is. It's like one big fist. You know, you know, if all these were the songs on the album, you know, you bought up. And it's like, you know, right. that's the way it's got to be. Or else we, we ain't gonna put out a record like that. All the songs have to kick butt, or it don't go on the album. All the all the albums that we listen to even today are albums that we listen to from beginning to end. And we definitely try to try to bring that uh, bring that together when we when we do a record together when we do an album we like to for it to be pleasing to the ears and uh, from beginning to, to end from whiskers to tail. Yeah.